All right, so, uh, so before we begin, uh, I would like to give a context in terms of uh, what are we talking about? You know, when I say uh, taming a dragon, you know, am I talking about some martial arts skills where I'm going to fight a dragon and do something? Any guess? Any guess? What do you guys have in mind uh, when you thought it's going to be taming a dragon? China. China, all right, okay, anything else? Top management. Oh my god, dragons being the top management. I didn't say that, not me. Okay, anyone else? Anything else? Anything else that comes to your mind? Sorting out the differences of cultural differences. Sorting out the cultural differences. All right, cool. So I'm, I'm like this, I was this very excited kid when, uh, I, recently when I did my assignment with, this was my first assignment with a team from China. Uh, I was like super excited going there to begin with, primarily because I don't know the language. You know, that's the first time I'm actually coaching a team where I don't speak their language. And language being one of the most important entities in whatever, whatever communication mechanisms that we have, uh, it was really, really difficult. But once I did there, you know, like once I finished my assignment, I was like super excited about the entire journey. And I really wanted to present something uh, to the audience or to the community and say, hey, this is what I've learned from this experience. That's pretty much about it. So now coming to uh, what am I going to talk here? Uh, to begin with, of course, I'm going to uh, say a few fundamentals which I believe or I'm going to reiterate some fundamentals which I think is very, very important uh, for any transformation or anything related to self or people or, or any, any sort of thing. And sorry about that, I'm also going to give you some prescriptions uh, which you may like or may not like, but you guys just uh, decide for yourself if you'd like to use it. Uh, so all the prescriptions that I'm going to give are like few basic tools that I've learned from uh, various uh, uh, practices. Like say, uh, I'm, I'm a practicing psychotherapist, so that way uh, I get to learn different models of psychology, different school of thoughts and uh, a lot of things. So that gives me a lot of experience in terms of uh, how to deal with people. A lot of life coaching, uh, so like, like Linda was explaining this morning, a lot of things about people. Uh, so what you may not get from this session, uh, you may not get uh, very standard data saying, of course, I'm going to tell you what happened as a result, uh, but, but I'm really not very focused on those aspects. But what I want to really do today is uh, uh, the difference, like basically, how is it going to be different from any agile journey session as I just want to give you an intro about what are the things that you have to remember, especially when there is a cultural context. You know, every time you're going to start dealing with somebody from a different culture, there are certain basic things that you might have to remember so that, you know, you have to get going. All right, so anyway, so I'll just get started. I'm very, very sad my presentation is not there. But uh, uh, it's available online. If somebody is having an online link, you can just guys Google for it. It's in SlideShare. It's called Taming the Dragon. Okay, uh, so now let's talk about uh, uh, cultural sensitivity. <coughs> Uh, so the first, the first thing, the first, the first and the foremost thing about anything related to culture is to be very sensitive about what we are talking about because these are, these are very, very close to us. You know, let's say today, uh, uh, see, I come, from a, I come from a South Indian family. So even though I'm, you know, India is very diverse and every time I go to a different place, I learn something new, something new, you know, something exciting. And it's very, very important how I perceive it. When it's even more important, when especially it's going to be cross-culture, so many words and so many explanations, we still misunderstand each other. So imagine what would be the impact it's going to make when you're going to deal with someone who doesn't speak your language. So cultural sensitivity in my mind is very, very important. Not just cultural sensitivity, but in other words, just being sensitive to another person about their needs, about what they want and stuff like that. So today I'm going to really iterate some ideas about what is expected uh, in our cultural context. So here is a slide I have uh, which just says, uh, you guys can't see anyway, it just says greedy soul and that's about me. Uh, so why I call myself greedy is because uh, I have a metaphor of Ravana as well. So Ravana is my metaphor, not in the wrong sense. I think most of you know Ravana, right? I think all of you know Ravana. I'm not saying I'm like super intelligent, nor I'm saying I'm a bad guy like Ravana as it is portrayed in the mythology. But I like doing multiple things, you know, I like to uh, experiment with multiple roles. So that way, I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm a practicing psychotherapist and uh, I, I'm, I'm part of a, a Latin American dance group. So we just perform all over the world. And I'm a foodie, I'm a reader, I have a book club and stuff like that. And I'm also an agile coach. So that's how it works. Oh. So, and any questions? So I work for Agile FAQs. If you want to well, reach me in Twitter, my idea, idea would be KKB, K-A-Y, K-A-Y, B-E-E, -E, as in it comes from the Bumblebee idea, all right? 
So let's move on to the uh, slides now. So like I said, one of the biggest barriers I had when I spoke about uh, cultural sensitivity, when I spoke about coaching, one of the barriers I had when I just looked into myself and saw, okay, what is that, uh, what is that I'm going to offer to this particular team? What is the challenge here? One thing I realized was language. Uh, and why language, especially in the context of coaching? Uh, I, uh, when, I, when I was just thinking about it, I knew that all the while I've been coaching for like what, five, five to six years now. And like in the past five to six years, my primary means of gathering information was language. The words they use, you know, the, the word, I mean, of course, there's a lot of uh, human cues as well. But one of the primary elements that I've always perceived were like words, like say, for example, to make it as cliche as it sounds, when somebody tells me that, you know, I have assigned this work to a team member, I quickly go and grab that opportunity and tell them, we don't assign work in Agile, you know, people pick up tasks from Agile. So assign being a primary word. But when I'm working with a team where I don't understand the language, I realize how important it was to my coaching practice. So it naturally happened that I have to find out new ways of engaging my team, you know, identify new ways to interact with them. So what do you think is the best way? So let's say if I can't speak, how, what is the best way? Someone knows sign language here? Somebody? You know, you know sign language? A little bit? So let's say what is this? This? Okay. You're saying calm, all right, okay, uh, fine. Uh, what does it mean? Something, you know, it's, it's something you like understand that I'm talking something about I like you, or I, you know, I love you, or whatever. So there is, there, is, there is a connection, so I'm not even speaking, but still we are able to connect because we all are connected even without us knowing it. Half the time when I coach the teams, I always tell them, you know, if you feel something, just talk about it. It need not be right. You know, I remember one of the speakers, I really appreciate her for her courage for what she said. I, I really don't believe in, uh, I'm not an agile fanatic to begin with, I just believe that there is a possibility, you know, it's, 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 like, it's like the same possibility that we have with the universe, like say there are more planets, you know, maybe the planets we have identified are not planets really, stuff like that. So I just believe in the possibility, so always speak your feelings out. So what I decided to do was to engage this element of human connection, you know, to start being close to them even without speaking the language. So what are the things I have to do? So obviously when I'm going to talk about human connection, it's going to be a two-way process, right? I cannot stand in the, you know, like say in a pedestal and say, hey guys, you are the ones I'm going to change you now. It doesn't work that way. You guys agree? Yeah? So I'll, I'll tell you once something very interesting. Uh, so somebody have, anyone here have done a, attended a therapy session? A therapy session with any therapist or a counselor? Nobody? All same people? I'm so insane, sorry. So <laughs> I have done a lot of therapy sessions with my therapist and for practice as well as for my own self journey. Uh, so one of the things they do primarily is uh, every time I talk about an issue, you know, obviously I'm in the thick of it, so I naturally don't get into solutioning mode very easily. So what the therapists do usually is the first thing they do is they just touch on touch me either on my shoulder or on my thighs, you know, somewhere they just give a comforting touch. What does it mean? It just means empathy. You know, they just tell me non-verbally that I empathize with you. You know, when you're doing this, I really empathize with what you're saying. A simple nod, a simple, you don't even use words, you know, a simple acknowledgement would give a lot of hope to the party that you're speaking to. That's exactly what you have to do when you're talking about being empathetic. So in other words, the first thing that I believe that one has to take care is be empathetic to your party. <coughs> now, let's, let's again redefine or you know, confine the scope of discussion that we have today. Uh, so obviously, I, I told you that we are talking about uh, various cultures, but in this case, since the title is Taming the Dragon, I'm going to talk about uh, the aspects of Chinese culture only. So this, this, this particular thing, which I have observed, which I've also taken a reference from papers, uh, there are like three major aspects that is very, very important in any Chinese uh, adoption, I believe. The first one is uh, hierarchy and harmony. So there is some kind of harmony which coexists with hierarchy. You know, that is something most Asian cultures could identify with. You know, we all are harmony. We are, we are in harmony, but we also know that there are like these underlying boundaries. You know, when, when a manager says this, when a team member says this, when a coach says this, things are very different. 
So obviously, if I have to give, give you a little trick, we also play around with those ideas. Like say for instance, earlier when I used to coach for an assignment, we used to work in three teams. Like I think it was a, it was a, mem it was a three member coaching team where I'm, I'm meeting the junior and I had an engineering manager and I had a very, very senior director in my team. So we all convey the same message, but we don't convey, I mean, let's say if I have to say something, I will say things to peer groups. Let's say if it has to be very strong and let's say it has to be like, you know, do it, then the director will say that. When it's going to be something about engineering practices, then these guys will say that. But primarily thinking about it, we all going to speak the same language. But subconsciously, it so happens that we all work with boundaries. We all believe that if this person is going to say this, it's very credible. Obviously, if you're going to be a consultant, you need more gray hair. You know, more salt and pepper you look, you're more respected because they believe that you can give them more knowledge than what it is. Anyway, so that, that's, that's a very uh, hierarchical thing. And talking about the next one, the next one is Guanxi. So Guanxi networks, what, what do you mean by Guanxi is relationships. So like many Asian cultures, people also work with relationships. Like say, it is not just about me, it is always about my team. I don't want to ha hurt or harm another person. Uh, you know, this is something I'm, I'm sure most of you would have experienced in your organization, be it a guy or manager. And the last one is Mianxi. So Mianxi means face value here. So what I mean by face value here is, uh, um, there is a very nice metaphor in Tamil, but I'm, I'm sure most of you doesn't understand Tamil here, so I'm going to say it in English. So it, it just goes like, uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to hurt someone's face, by which what I mean is, you don't want to put them down in front of another person. You know, let's say many times when we speak of conversations with your teams, you don't want to hurt them, you know, let's say, I, I don't want to, I mean, you don't want to shame them at any level, you don't want to shame them by anything. So that's what they mean by face value. So these are three primary elements that we have with any Chinese culture. So now this being the criteria, so check this out. Sorry? Okay. No, it's not there. Okay, what should I do? Uh, I'm do this and continue. So sorry about that, guys. Um, so, talk, so talking about uh, the culture itself, there are like three different aspects and now, now coming to what I have to do. So like I said, uh, I was really, really focused on changing myself than really changing the team. I think I'm going to let go of the presentation, I'm going to walk around and then I think I'm comfortable that way. Uh, so, uh, so what happened with my teams was, uh, I just realized there's something that I have to really do to make this transformation happen. The first and the foremost thing I decided to do was be very honest about what I feel and to be very genuine about what my emotions are and not to be faking it. If I don't like it, I don't like it. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to put them down and say, hey guys, this is what you guys are doing and I don't like it. But to say, tell it in a different way so that they also understand what I'm speaking about. Because I believe, or I very strongly believe that nothing, no message goes strong without being genuine. And the moment that you're giving a very genuine message, it comes from your heart, you're just there. So to give you a metaphor or to give you an example, uh, one of the things that happened with, uh, uh, I think these days many people ask me, like most of my colleagues, most of my peers who used to work with me, they started asking me, hey, I want to be an agile coach, what do I do? So what are the things I have to learn? You know, should I go learn this? Should I do this material and all that? So the only question I ask them is, fine, you want to be an agile coach, but my question is, do you really want to be an agile coach? Or are you doing it because there is a demand in the industry and everybody wants you to be an agile coach? Unless and until you are passionate about what you are doing, I don't think people will appreciate what you are saying. So that's one thing I realized and I thought, I'm going to be very passionate about it and if I'm not passionate, let me make peace with it. So that was the first one. So, all right, so this is what I decided. I just said, uh, keep calm and saying nihao. So nihao means hello. It means hello in Chinese. So I just decided that I will just identify what is the change that I need to do. I saw that's the first step. So what did I do? The first thing I did was be an explorer, be a child, and then connect. So what do I mean by that? I just thought, you know, let's say, let me just go explore this opportunity. Yes, I don't know Chinese. Yes, I have not worked with a team like this. So what, you know? Let me just go explore it. In fact, after making this presentation, I just realized that instead of using a dumpling picture here, I thought I should have used the picture of Queen, the movie Queen. Uh, I think most of you would have understood what I'm exactly talking about. You know, it's, it's, that's exactly what I mean. Just go with it. You know, just go for it. So that was the first thing. And second thing is, like I said, be genuine and be honest and be nice and be extra nice. There's no harm in being extra nice. So another incident again, uh, which actually, again, I'm talking because 
it tells you how much we value these human connections. So there was this like, time in China where I, was, I used to visit this Jewish shop every day. So uh, this guy uh, used to give me Jews, and we don't speak our language, right? So I showed him how to say this, and it is. That's how we used to communicate. So he used to give me something, and whatever he gave me, I used to drink. So one day when I just walked into the store, uh, this guy was very happy that I was like, visiting the store for like the third time. He just gave me an egg tart as a compliment. And I didn't even know that he's going to do that to me. And he doesn't have to do it. But being extra nice doesn't cost you anything. You know, like say, for example, when I do my assignments, it's, it's not that I'm kind of saying because, uh, because I realize that most people don't do it explicitly. When I talk to my teams, I give them gifts. It's, it's not like I'm going to get anything out of it, but just some small gifts. Just give them gifts, you know, just give them sweets. When they do their retrospective, tell them what they want. You know, it, it just makes them feel good. And another important thing, I just decided to listen actively. It's very different from listening. You know, you just know what it means? When I say listen actively, you just listen and you don't do anything at all. And you can actually see it. If you, do, if you don't understand this, you know, I mean, most often when you talk to your teams, you will know who is listening and who is not listening. So make sure you just listen actively. And most importantly, talk slowly. Have you faced this with your counterparts? Right? I think this is one of the things which most Indian teams have to look into it because culturally, I'm not sure if I'm being very fast right now, but culturally we are, we are so tuned to speak very fastly. So especially when you talk to someone from a different culture, it's very important to speak very slowly. Um, again, another example is I have a friend who works for Enable India and he's from Australia. Uh, so every time he talks to his colleagues, he tells them something and his constant complaint is, my colleagues tell me that they understand what I'm speaking. But finally, they don't do their job. So when he goes and asks them, they say, sir, we didn't understand you. So you know, it's, it's like very important for us to be very vocal about it if you don't understand. Always communication is a two-way channel. And the last but not the least, which is your respect. You know, start respecting your culture. You know, start respecting the fact that don't go and question their saying, hey, how can you do this? You know? uh, so this happens with, uh, uh, I'm not a vegan, nor I'm against uh, meat-eating population, but there's a very common bias which I've always faced. Even when I came from, came from China, the first question they asked me was, did you eat snake? And, and it's, it's not just that, it was in a very condescending way. You know, it was like, oh, do you guys eat snake? It's like that. You know, it's very, very important to appreciate the fact that people have different preferences and they eat different things and they live a different lifestyle. So the moment I just imbibed all these qualities and I thought this is what is going to make my way, I decided to do this. Oh, by the way, some of the pics you're going to see here are my pictures that I clicked from the experiences. So you guys can just go figure out. So now coming to the tools part. So now I'm done with the very generic part, what I wanted to talk about, you know, let's say in terms of the experiences. Now coming to the prescriptive element, which I'm not very fond of, but still I'm going to give you some tools that I use during this transformation. Oh, sorry. You know why slide 14 is a bad omen? Because in China, again, in culturally, when you say four, uh, four sounds like death. So they don't have fourth floor, they don't have 14th floor, they have, but usually these are for maintenance. They don't have uh, let's say if you have a 14 floor building, the 14 floor is usually for general maintenance. They have an air conditioning vent or something like that. So I decided to skip slide 14. So now coming to the tools here, uh, the very first tool that I'm going to introduce is, so this is something I spoke, uh, I spoke about this particular thing in the last conference as well, which, which happened in Bangalore, but I thought it's very contextual here, which are called contracts. Uh, so when I begin the talk, I just told you guys what I'm going to give you today and what I'm not going to give you today, which means I'm just kind of contracting with you guys in terms of what I'm going to offer. You know, will that be valuable to you? So you guys are very clear if you want to attend this session or you want to walk out of the session. Basically, I want to give you guys an option. It's, it's, it's not like you guys have to stay here because it's, it's said so. So this is one of the things which I often see even in Indian teams when we start coaching for them. Usually, your meetings like retrospectives, usually retrospectives, I would say, because that's where the entire team have to be part of. Most team members sit there because they say the managers want them to be. So what I do with my teams is even that happened in the Chinese teams as well, I give them an option. If you don't like to attend the meeting, please go. Trust me, I will not penalize you. If you're worried about your managers, trust me, I will not even tell them that you didn't attend this meeting. It's not very important for me, but what is very important is you attending, attending this meeting with complete willingness. I want you to make a choice here. 
And often when you attend the training program, I have these participants when I ask them, what is your goal from the session? Most team members say, I have this, I have that. And there are always one or two team members who tell me, I'm here because my manager asked me to. So the next question I ask them is, okay, now that you guys are here, you have decided to walk in, it's your choice. Now tell me what is your goal? Because it's very important for you guys to attend. Whatever time you spend, you should have something solid. Because if you guys don't understand what is expected, it's I cannot deliver what it is. So it's very, very important to contract. So again, contracts are of three levels. We call it as administrative, professional, and psychological. The administrative contract is very simple, which all of us understand. Venue, time, location, logistics, all blah. And the second one is professional contract. This again means, I'm sure most of you are nominated for the conference, or did you guys voluntarily go and say, hey, I want to attend the Agile conference. How many people volunteered for the conference? Wow, that's nice, cool. So anyway, so when you say a professional contract, often it happens that if you're a manager, if you're an Agile coach, your organization expects you to do certain things because your role demands that. So that is your professional contract. So many times that goes with sync. But the last one is your psychological contract. This is where I want to emphasize on because most often we don't ask this question. Like say, it is understood that if you're a scrum master, you have to just go face the product owner and say, hey, I want to do this. But what you have to do here is ask a scrum master if he or she is willing to do it and see how it changes the entire scenario. Just ask them. And if they are not willing to do it, just give them a chance. Just give them an opportunity to explore what they actually need. See, by which I'm not, I don't mean that uh, you're going to make a plan for failure. These are not plans for failure, but make safe and secure experiments. Things that you can actually live with. If it's a small meeting, if it doesn't have a bigger goal, try it out. I mean, primarily if this is for coaches, but this is something you can always use with any of your team members. So you understand this, so don't demand a person to do something just because the role says so. Give them a chance, you know, ask them if they really want to do it. If they cannot, help them. First time they do it, second time they do it, third time, trust me, they will do it by themselves. Oh, there she is, I think she was the one who was talking about, uh, you were talking about that. I, I really appreciate that because, you know, I believe that is very important. You know, give them a chance, give them an opportunity to say what they like. Many times, all they want to do is just talk, all right? Okay, and I think this is a very common thing. Uh, again, one example from the therapy sessions is most often men and women come for counseling, right? They have problems with their marital life or like boyfriend, girlfriend, and often many things. So one problem or constant problem in the risk of stereotyping is they say, uh, the guy is not listening. He's not listening to me. He doesn't listen to what I'm speaking about. Uh, you know, when, when you ask the guy, like, it's very irritating for me because I'm coming from work and all that blah. But ideally what women want, or rather any human being want is to just talk. They're not looking for solutions. They're not looking for you to come and solve it for them, but just vent it out. And the same logic applies here. All right, so what is the next one? So this is, again, another NLP-based technique, which I call it as uh, two-chair technique. So someone has done it with your teams before? Anyone? You know what it is? Uh, so two chair is it's like as good as if you have to remember something. It's like as simple as doing a role play. Uh, so often, especially deal with it when you have a conflicting situations, when you are in a conflict, uh, just put them together. Like say, uh, for example, there is a conflict between a scrum master and a team member and ask them what it is. And you know, often uh, role, role plays are played by the one, per one person, right? Not by two people. Right? So ask them what it is. And many times as human beings, you know, like as Linda said in the morning, we don't know what we are. So, but this particular process really helps you understand where you are headed. Like say, for example, if I have a conflict with my boss, you know, I'm not able to speak it out. I'm like, okay, he did this, he did this to me, he did this to me, and I'm like kind of uh, keeping this against me. It's very important for you guys to bring it out or is it going to impact your work? So what I do is I just ask my team member to play the role of an employee saying, okay, this is my point, you know, this is where I come from. Now what I ask the person is, now okay, now assume that you are the manager, sit on the other chair and explain possibly why the manager would be doing those things. You know what I mean? Basically I'm trying to get into the shoes of other person or in other words, I'm trying to be empathetic and not being sympathetic. It, it actually works wonders, try it with your teams and tell me if it works for you, but I've often done it with many teams where I have seen strong resistance from people who doesn't want to adopt something. There's always a reason. There's always a reason why they don't want to do things. Listen to them. It's very, very important. So that's about two chair technique. And what about the next tool? And the next tool is, yes, you have a question? You want the slide? It doesn't help. Yes. No, no, I just want to understand. <laughs> oh. 
Yes. And you have to train on someone else to play the role of you. Yes. Like say, uh, for example, you're coaching a person, let's say there's a conflict, uh, it's okay to involve both the parties also because, but what, what happens in the thick of the moment is we have a lot of these personal uh, notions to it, you know, somehow we really don't resolve it quickly, but one of the ways to easily resolve it is to put the person in one chair and ask them to change roles and how we have to do it kinesthetically is change the person from one chair to another and trust me, it works. And your team members will have resistance when you're doing this because when, when you start ask them to speak for themselves, they sit in the same chair and they will not move. But ask them to move from one chair to another because one chair to another because that's how it works. Kinesthetics is also very important. You, you get what I mean, everyone? All right, okay. So any other questions or I'll move on to the next part. So the next part is it's about uh, using culture specific met metaphors. You know, metaphors have always been my way of explaining things because it's very, very easy for me to connect that way. Uh, so when I went to China again, some of the metaphors that I started using to explain Agile, I thought I'll just share it with you. Uh, so obviously chopsticks, I was very, very fascinated with chopsticks because from day one I had been like trying to eat and trying to eat, I'm like very proud I can eat now. So, uh, you know, uh, eating with chopsticks, you know, it's, it's, it's the best metaphor for pairing for me. You know, it's not like one chopstick is going to be higher than the other. It's not like one chopstick is going to wait and watch until the other one has the food. You guys have to work together. You guys have to work together and take the food and then eat it. And listen, until you do that, it's not pairing. It's not going to help you guys the way it has to. I believe, again, it's not a norm. It's not like you have to force people to say, hey, you better sit and give me value. But let them be. But tell them what it is. Another metaphor that I got from China again is, uh, uh, interestingly, when I was looking at their addresses, all these addresses were written this way. Let's say, uh, if this place, I, I remember Bangalore address, let's say, I'll tell my address. It's like, uh, it goes like, my, I live in Indranagar, so it's like 123, 18th Main, Indranagar, Bangalore. Uh, but how they write their addresses, Bangalore, Indranagar, 18th Main, 123. What is the difference? It's like the other way around. So when I just looked at the others, obviously I don't understand anything about Chinese. I don't even understand the script. So I just asked them, is it like you guys read your, is your scripts read from right to left? Because that, that's how I perceive it, because it's written as the last thing I see is a number. Uh, but they told me, no, it's not like that we always write it the other way around. It's the important thing. So which in my mind is more like the way how you write user stories. You start with something big and then, you, and then you confine your scope, come slowly define it and finally you have where I am. If I'm going to just say Bangalore, you guys will not know where I live. But if I'm going to tell you 123, and also what is very important is, without saying it's Bangalore, Indranagar, 18th Main, 123 doesn't make any sense. The same way how it works with user stories. Right? So this was a very effective metaphor for me. So try adopting some metaphors like this from your own work experiences. It could be specific to Indian teams as well. So any questions here? Okay, so what is the next one? Model behaviors. So when I say model behaviors, uh, uh, so it was very interesting. Uh, so why, why I have put this picture, the picture has a story behind it. So this, was, this happened at uh, the Forbidden City at Beijing. Uh, so there's this child who, are, who was this particular child that you see in the picture. He was asked to wear these clothes for a picture and he, was, he refused to do it because he found it too cumbersome and he didn't like it. And what his father did was he immediately picked a similar outfit and he just wore it. And you can see his father's hand there, and you can see he's wearing the same clothes. So he started wearing it, and the child was so excited, and he also wore the same clothes. So that's what I mean by modeling behavior. So even as a coach, when you start working with the team, don't just go tell them that do this, do that, but start modeling them. Let's say one of the important things I do is, again, on a human aspect is dealing with conflicts. We often tell our teams, be open, be honest about what you're thinking, be transparent, but it's very important for you to model it. Whenever you have a problem, ask yourself if you're being very honest and vocal about it. The team members will start knowing that. So what is the next one? Oh, yeah, you, you see Bruce Lee there. So it's like set goals, ask feedback every single time. And this is very, very important because unless and until you define, uh, I, I mean, I would think it's a very trivial thing, but after coaching many teams for like many, I'd say for five, six years now, I realized that this is something we don't do efficiently. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this tool. It's, it's not even a tool. In fact, all of us know that. But the problem is we don't take this very seriously. It's very important to set goals, ask feedback every single time. Whatever you do, ask them whether it works for them or not. Not just in papers, but ask them. Go talk to them. <laughs> no, no, no. I thought it was like, uh, uh, this guy is very goal oriented and I, I really like this picture. So that's, that's pretty much. Yeah, that's Bruce Lee. So this, this is at uh, Avenue of Stars, Hong Kong. 
so it's from there. So last one, incremental group discussions. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon that I noticed. When I just attended the team, I do a lot of one-on-ones with my team because it really, really works for me. Uh, so I start talking to the teams. So when I started work, talking to each person, everybody gave me feedback. You know, they told me what is working, what is not working. They started bashing Agile. I just listened patiently to all of them. I had my own list of things that I have to talk in a group discussion. So I just pull in all, I just call all the managers, I call the director, I call everyone. Now I ask the team members, guys, just go tell what is your problem. Trust me, there's not even a single person who told me there was a problem. I was shocked. You know, I was like, okay, what is happening here? So then I realized that the part about hierarchy and harmony plays a very important role here, and, and also about relationships. It's, I'm not saying that the manager is a bad person. I think somebody told me yesterday how often managers are looked at as some kind of entity, but that's not the case. It's always co-created relationships. Just give them a chance. You know, just speak your heart out. We will not know what is going to happen later, right? So what I did was I just started t talk talking to my teams and I just told them uh, I started doing incremental group discussions instead of doing everybody together. First I did with one, two people, then I slowly increased it to three, four, five, six, and I started noticing behaviors. I started seeing, okay, what is happening every time I add a new person into the team. So in a way, it also helped me identify problems. You know, there is always the power dynamics which plays in the teams. So it really helps you figure out where it comes from. All right. So finally, this is for prosperity again. So now that you guys have sat through and endured my conversation or endured my discussion here, so this is for you. It's called Bok Shoi. It's, it's, it's called a Napa Forbid, in other words, which is a sign of prosperity in any Chinese culture. So that's pretty much. So uh, if, uh, if you just look at it, I didn't even speak about what exactly I did. I'm not even going to talk about what I actually did in an assignment because that is not what it is because we all have been doing it. If I have to quickly run you through the kind of things that we did after this, once I had set the context with the team, obviously, I did a lot of things with the team because the major problem that I've noticed in the team was on pacing, on user story slicing, and obviously on testing. So I had to work on these three parameters on different kinds of trainings and uh, you know, awareness exercises which obviously most of us would know, so I'm not going to run through it. As far as the results are concerned, I was pretty happy with the results because, uh, like I said, they, these guys, they listen actively. And in the first one sprint, they could actually show me zero defect sprint. I was very, very impressed with what they did. I was mightily happy because, you know, all we did was like just two months. It was just a very small assignment, but I could actually show results in two months. I'm not just saying it has to be like that, but it kind of tells me so much about uh, how much they listen to you, how actively, how seriously they take whatever you're saying. Uh, I was very, very happy with the exercise. By which what I mean to say is what I want to convey, you know, if I have to summarize and say, uh, what is the message here? The message is, it's not necessary that you have to change everything about a culture. There are always elements that you can pick and choose. So here in this case, the only aspects that I have to work on was the hierarchy part and slightly on the relationship part because they should be open about their conflicts and Talk to each other. It's okay if, if you're going to say a bad thing, but say it in a nice way. Be extra nice. That's pretty much. Uh, so those are the things I wanted to change. But otherwise, there were a lot of values that I was gaining based on the other aspects as well, because the networks they had. That was valuable. So you don't have to change everything. So be wise here. You know, Just pick things that really make sense, and then modify only those things. Just before I close, again, this is from Linda's talk. These guys in this particular team, like Linda said, they have food together. And this was one of my first initial observations. I told the managers, and I appreciated them for doing that because it's very important that you have to recognize good things. They have food together, and they talk about work. All the team, it was a very small team, so there was an auntie who used to come and cook food for us. They used to call her auntie. I really liked it. You know, it's not even like some lady or something. They used to call her as auntie. So they used to come and cook food for the entire team, and I think it's phenomenal. It's one of the best things that you can expect from an agile team. So that's from me. Any questions? I'm done. Thank you. So questions? Yes. Going back to uh, the point of being extra nice, mm -hmm. so yes. the two ways in which you do that, materialistically and you know, some other uh, uh, ways. The example that you gave of giving gifts, is that always, or, or they, can there be instances where it can be harmful? Very good question. So uh, this point is connected with the first point where I said, be genuine. It's not just about being nice and extra nice, but being genuine about what it is. So don't give them gifts every day, they know you're faking it. 
So just go and give it to them when they have done something, when you know that they have achieved something. It's almost like an incentive, right? But not in a bad way, but it has to come from within. Just give something, especially personalized gifts, I think it makes a lot of sense. I don't know, I have the picture with me right now, but this is something I do with my teams. Every time I finish my assignment, I always give a personalized gift to them. It's not like something I buy from a store. I, like say, one of the favorite quotes that I have is like Mary Popendick once said, lean be with you. Uh, so I think that's very, very powerful for me. It's a very powerful affirmation. So most often I, ha I have actually created a poster for my teams with a mush, which says, lean be with you. I, I just keep this as a memoir to them. You know? They can just have it with them. So try creating something like that. And it has to be genuine. You will not put your heart and soul into it. You will not make an effort to do something if it is just going to be for the heck of it. Did I answer your question? Sort of. Sort of, but uh, all right, fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? All right, so thank you so much, guys. And sorry about the presentation again. Yeah.